Welcome back, everyone. It's 11.15-ish, and we are about to begin our third session. But before we do, I'm just going to shout out is uh, Elder Gordon in the house? Yeah, he'll join us, I'm sure, later. So uh, I am pleased to uh, welcome you back for those who are returning and welcome you too for those who are joining as we respectfully uh, gather from territories of ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq where we're celebrating the Restigouche watershed today, the Wallistaque and the Passamakati peoples. It is our hope that we can gather in friendship today, even though we're virtually connecting uh, during these uncertain times as we search for healing and reconciliation and learn from the land. I would love to welcome at this time, I'm sorry, my video's off. I'd like to welcome at this time, um, Elder Gordon Labillois, who uh, opened for us this morning. And I know, Gordon, you are not going to be with us for the whole day. Um, I'm kind of putting you on the spot. If you would like to share a little bit about yourself and the rest of Goosh, and then I'm going to turn the floor back over to Mr. Bernie Daigle, who will take us to the Wabanaki Forest. So, um, Elder Labillois, I've I have offered you virtually this tobacco, and I know that you accepted it this morning. May I offer to, it, to offer it to you once again uh, as you uh, continue on for the next session? I'm putting him on the spot, and he's muted. Gordon, you're muted. Okay, I should be on mute now, but I just step back into the room. And I missed, uh, I missed the, uh, your, your conversation with me, the early part of it. I just cut the tail end of it. So maybe that, you can. Uh, that is okay. I uh, welcome yeah, yeah. you back. You've been with us all morning and I know you did an opening at 8.30 and I invite you, if you would like to take a few minutes to uh, reintroduce yourself for those who are new to the, um, new to the room, the Zoom room, before we give Bernie the floor to talk about the Wabanaki Forest. Yes, um, my name is Elder Gordon Labilwa. I've been around the block for uh, the better part of uh, almost a half a century in different in different governance uh, roles. I was an elected member of the Eel River Bar Band Council for the better part of 40 years. I was uh, kind of one of the, uh, one of the persons who led charge on behalf of our, uh, of our um, First Nations of Lestigosh and uh, Eel River to head up the, the Restigosh Watershed Camp, uh, rest Council, and uh, my lifetime is, uh, has been about protecting and developing our First Nation community. You know, I, I, I live on a small community that's going to be significantly impacted by, uh, that has and will continue to be significantly impacted by sea level rising. Our community will probably have to go probably be displaced from this land uh, within a hundred years, despite our best efforts to try to protect it. So, uh, so that is, uh, I'm uh, in my role as an elder, speaking for our people, one, one of the elders who give me my name said, you have the right, you have the responsibility of speaking on behalf of your people. So liberally, I look at that saying, I speak on behalf of our ancestors who went to their graves, not feeling at home in our homeland from the displacement of lands, resources, culture. I speak on behalf of the people today that are here. And I speak 
on behalf of the future generations to come, hoping that we, that we can give some hope to them and, and so that they will indeed feel like at home under on their ancestral land. I, uh, I live at the mouth of the, uh, we're the second community at the mouth of the, of the world-renowned Heritage River, the Restigus Drainage, Restigus River. That's where the, the, the river, river meets the bay, right, 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 a couple of miles up the bay from us. It's uh, my family is, uh, my family is uh, basically divided between Lestigos and the Yellow River, the Ladova family. Uh, our people have been on this, have lived, you know, uh, on this area since, since time immemorial. There, there's recent evidence of, of artifacts found in our backyard here dating back 4,400 years. We are we reside right here now in an area. Lestigoshi River Bar are in the uh, at, we're at the focal point or center of uh, of, of District Seven of the the Gespiwagi District of the uh, of the Mi'kma'ki, which consists of seven districts, and this one is alluded to as the last land because it was the last land to be uncovered by ice as the as the ice rescinded. We are Mi'kmaq people who, uh, who, who rely, who have relied and will and continue to rely on the bountiful resources uh, from the land and the waters and on our ancestral lands. Uh, our DNA is very connected to the deer, the moose, the salmon, the lobsters in our area. Uh, the the uh, restigus drainage, you know, when you look at it, it gives us access, our people historical access to lands all around us and to watersheds all around us. The restigus has five five fingers to its to its five tributaries to its to the restigus river. It's the main restigus, which even acts as the boundary river between Quebec and New Brunswick. The the Mattapedia and Patapedia rivers drain into, uh, you know, they drain from the Gas Bay into the into the main Restigos. Well, those rivers give you access to the to with a short portage and jumping on rivers that'll take you into the Saint Lawrence. You know, where uh, gives you access to the Saint Lawrence. The Kijewick River gives you access so with, with a short portage into one of the rivers that'll take you into the St. John and the uh, Upsequitch drainage will, will give you access to the, to the headwaters of the, uh, of the Nepisequit, the Restigosh, excuse me, the, the Upsequitch, the Nepisequit, the Marmashi, and the Tobik rivers at the base in the general area below Mount Carleton. So short portage is put you into all these uh, into all these rivers. So, uh, so again, just for a little bit of uh, expansion of, of dissemination of knowledge, Big Mouth people are coastal people that came that came out to the out to, to the waters to the to the either to the to the coastal areas or within the brackish waters of the tidal waters. Of the rivers that dumped into the Bachelor of Marmaji Bay. Our winter homes were inland where the deer and moose yards. And there was even just below, below Listigosh, the community of Listigosh, our people would gather in a place called Yuskimanak when they were venturing up, up uh, to their winter homelands. And the, the hereditary chief would say, Okay, this is where you go this year. This is where. You, this clan goes this year, so that there was, there was some, uh, there was an organized fashion of how, of what areas you went to stay and what areas you went to harvest for that for that given time. You didn't go back to the same drainage the next year. So uh, one of the things that I, my, what my, my daughter brought home from. Uh, 
from New Zealand. Something that resonated with me. You know, you get educated in life. It's a continued learning, a learning journey of, uh, of learning. When she came back from uh, that, uh, from that four month visit down there where she had uh, an audience with the, with the uh, prime, prime minister of that country. But what from the Maori, what, what they shared with her, they said, water doesn't separate us, it connects us. So really when you look at the interconnection of all the oceans and the watersheds in our area, I mean, I just talked to you about how, what access the world renowned heritage river gave you to other drainages and other lands. It's, it's a little bit of an example. So water, water is one of the most significant gifts and elements that sustain life. The only thing above, above that, I guess, uh, is oxygen, which you need more, and you need, you need the, you need the sun to, uh, you know, to, to, to give us that heat and, and that energy. Uh, the protection of the, of the watersheds. Paramount. The watersheds and the lands are paramount to our people. If, and, and if, if, if they were there to sustain us for tens of thousands of years, we want it to be there for future generations. Taking that era that we're in with climate change right there now and the significant changes that we've witnessed over a short period of time, you know, since the European has come to these new lands, you know, we have done a, a bang up job at, at destroying a continent. So the turn things around now are, are uh, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're beyond the point of, of no return now. So now it's about adjustment and trying to scale back the, the damage that we're inflicting on our first mother. So, so I think that is, so I think this is, uh, I'm, as, more, uh, as more education and more collaboration takes place, the better we're all off. And, uh, and that's a challenge that we have, trying to do the right thing for ourselves, for our relations, and when we talk about our relations, we're all related, and we're related all to the, the four-legged, the two-legged, the wing, and the fin. So, so that's 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 where the First Nation communities come from. Where our organization is also to uh, looking at at at, at the indig indigenous protected areas, trying to do our thing there. We're, collaborate with governments to try to try to help play a role too. And uh, a little closer to home, I know Heron Island is one of the areas that we've identified should be protected for future generations. It's our little gem out in the bay that has, has been there for our people. Our people are buried on that land. Our, our relationship with that land through the clamming, through the, uh, through the medicines and from the sweet grass that that's out there uh, or something that that's very dear to us so i wasn't expected to, to say a few more words this afternoon but i just thank you for the opportunity and i'll and i'll uh i'll stop off now so thank you and no, i think won't be around this afternoon i want to thank 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 the organizers organizers for bringing this uh this myomi together <laughs> I think we're we're all be a little bit better off as a result of that of that sharing that information. Thank you. Well, I want thank you so much, Gordon. I am honored to have you back for a second time. And uh, yeah, and the one thing that I forgot to mention again, my, my mom's words again were sitting overlooking the Bay of Shalor, and, and here's the bay, some 150 feet from her living room from her living room. She'd always tell me, Dad, is your fish mark important? To the liberal, you know, liberally, I said, okay, if that's our fish market, the land is our meat market in, uh, in, in our food. So, uh, so I think that helps to put things in their context. Uh, and in these times, you know, uh, food security for people, 
in our area and throughout the world in, in, in other countries, you know, we don't have to go to foreign countries to, to look at the poverty that exists on some of our communities. So having a, my daughter just went out on the hunt last week and they brought home almost. So what that means for winter, we have food for winter. Okay, 12. Wow. <laughs> Okay. 11.30. And that was taken from the kitchen. Yeah. Thank you so much, Gordon. I am going to um, continue with this theme of humanity, bridging, environment, connection, uh, first peoples and non-Indigenous peoples coming together with a common goal to, to uh, conserve and protect and be humble on the land. And I think this day is a wonderful reminder of what the land provides us and the water provides us and gives us a chance to escape um, maybe some of those anxieties we're all feeling right now in the world. So with no further ado, uh, thank you, Gordon, again, and welcome to the Wabanaki Forest with uh, my lovely friend Bernie Daigle. Maybe, maybe, maybe before you go there, uh, the closing of the meeting, maybe uh, maybe Stevie can see if uh, he, he's the guy that hoodwinked me into this. So maybe he can close off the meeting with a little prayer. Wonderful. Yes, I'll ask Steve that he'll be on this afternoon. And the other the other thing, you know, I've been, uh, that's not, you know, it's music to my ears when you talk about the web course because I've been saying that for a bit. You know, it's, it's nice that the newcomer has taken the liberty to, to call it the Acadian Forest. And, but yeah, it's the Web Forest is the, the proper name and it should be a name that's attached to our to, to our lands. Thank you very much. Our pleasure, Gordon. And I, just a little reminder to those who have come on, welcome. We're going to ask that you just mute yourself so we don't get any dogs barking and, and phones ringing while we're recording. And welcome again, Bernie. Thank you, Pamela. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Elder Gordon. Um, before starting, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the unsurrendered and unceded traditional lands of the Wallistic Way, uh, as I'm from the Fredericton area. As you can see on the slide, my name is uh, Bernie Daigle, and I work with Natural Resources Canada, and more specifically, the Canadian Forest Service. Um, today, I'll be talking to you about trees, and we'll be learning to identify trees using a tool called a dichotomous key. Um, I, I think that Pamela sent uh, those keys out, but you won't be needing them for today's presentation. I've got the, the key as part of the slides and I'll, I'll, I'll be going through the, the process. Um, I'll be using the keys to identify trees and give some uh, traditional indigenous uses for those trees. And, um, I think the objective is that afterwards you can use those keys to go out and try it out for yourself. But you have to remember that the key will only work for um, trees that you find out in nature, like uh, out in, in the woods. It, it won't work well with trees that might be in your neighborhood because a lot of those trees are uh, introduced. They're, they're not indigenous to the region. Uh, I've also included some uh, Mi'kmaq names uh, for the trees. Uh, I found a really nice uh, online website called Mi'kmaqonline.org. Uh, it was uh, developed or produced by Mi'kmaq in the Gas Bay. So some of the pronunciations or spellings might be a little bit different. Um, I'm also missing a few of the tree names. So I would greatly appreciate if uh, anyone could help me filling those few blanks. So the trees in uh, New Brunswick and throughout most of the Maritimes are in what people call, uh, as Elder Gordon uh, alluded to, uh, the Acadian forest region. Uh, as you can see, there are many forest regions across the Canada. The largest one is this big one that stretches from uh, coast to coast, the, the dark green and the light green, and that's called uh, the boreal forest. 
The Acadian forest region uh, cover is uh, this section in orange here, covers most of New Brunswick, most of Nova Scotia, all of PEI, and actually extends down um, into the state of Maine, uh, New Hampshire, parts of Vermont, New York, and Massachusetts. However, um, as again, uh, Elder Gordon uh, pointed out, this region has a much older name, and that names existed for thousands of years. And that name is uh, the Wabanaki. Um, the Wabanaki include uh, the Maliseet, the Mi'kmaq, the Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations. And they were known as people of Donland. And that sort of makes sense because uh, we're on the eastern part of North America. So the, the Wabanaki would have been the first people to see the rising sun or the dawn. Uh, last winter, uh, we had another Learning from the Land event, and Grand Chief Ron Trombley told the story of the creation of the Wabanaki and how the Wabanaki came from the roots of a great ash tree that was split by an arrow that was shot by Glooscap. According to uh, oral histories or, or stories, the Wabanaki have been living in this reason in this region since the beginning of time, but there's actual physical proof in the form of archeological records that tell us that the Wabanaki have been here for much, much longer than that. And some records uh, push that to uh, about 13,000 years. So at least since after the last uh, ice age, uh, the Wabanaki used the forest for shelter, food, tools, weapons, medicine, uh, and many of these uses continue to this day. Um, the forest is also important uh, for cultural and spiritual uh, needs of the, of the Wabanaki and, and indigenous people. But uh, today, as I said, we're gonna talk about, uh, about trees. Um, and trees, uh, although they're all around us, um, they're not always easy to identify and to know exactly what tree that we're talking about. The first thing we have to know is whether we're looking at a soft, <coughs> excuse me, a softwood tree like you see on, on the left here. They're also called evergreens or conifers because all uh, softwoods produce uh, these cones or uh, hardwood trees or deciduous trees. Uh, they're called deciduous because at this time of year, as you can see, uh, they lose um, their leaves. Um, another challenge is that trees go by uh, many different names and a lot of those names have to do with the characteristic of the tree. Um, white spruce or uh, goatqua, um, uh, also known as pasture spruce because they tend to grow in old fields, old abandoned fields, or skunk spruce or cat spruce uh, because of the, the strong smell that you get when you uh, crush the needles. Uh, sugar maple or sanawi, uh, hard maple, rock maple, or other names. Um, Eastern larch is one of those species that I couldn't find a Mi'kmaq name for, but uh, people also call it tamarack, hackmatack, or juniper. Um, white birch, uh, mashgui, um, paper birch, canoe birch, and black ash, uh, a species that's tremendously important to indigenous people um, called wishawk. Um, it's called basket ash because it's used by artisans to, to make beautiful baskets. Hoop ash because it was used to, uh, to make barrels. Uh, swamp ash because where it tends to grow and brown ash because of the color of its bark. Um, I mentioned to use the key only in, in forested areas. And that's one of the reasons for that is that we have many non-Indigenous uh, species. And the example I'm showing here um, on up on top is uh, sugar maple. And you can see that the leaves of sugar maple and the one below here, uh, Norway maple, are quite similar. And, and a lot of people mistake Norway maple for sugar maple. If you look at other characteristics, we have here um, 
this is actually the, the fruit of the maple trees. A lot of people call it seed, but the seed is actually just this part that's inside this, this uh, top part here. In sugar maple, that's quite round. In Norway maple, it's quite flat. Another characteristic that you can look at if you, if you want to get really uh, a bit more uh, particular is uh, the buds. And uh, the buds of sugar maple are quite pointy, almost sphere-like. And the ones of uh, Norway maple are, are rounded. So just to to uh, to say that uh, not all species around here are uh, are indigenous or belong to uh, the traditional Wabanaki forest. We have ten softwood species, so that's that's not not that many really. Uh, balsam fir, eastern hemlock, cedar, uh, larch three species of pine and three species of uh, spruce. And we can identify them by some of their characteristics. And what we're looking at here is um, on the left, the foliage, it can be scale-like and the rest are, are, are needles. The needles can be in bundles or groups. Uh, this is uh, the needles of uh, tamarack. Um, these are the needles of white pine. They're always in bundles of five, or the needles can be single. Uh, example up on top here is uh, hemlock or uh, white spruce. Um, the key that was sent also has pictures in the back um, to show the cones. And the key that was sent also has descriptions of cones, because oftentimes you might be looking at a tree and all the needles or the, the foliage is way up, but there are always cones on the ground and you can pick those and those can give you a good an indication of uh, what that tree species is because the cones can be quite different. So we're talking about a dichotomous key. So what exactly is that? Well, it's a tool and it's used to help us identify plants or animals and Essentially, how it works is it's a series of questions, and each question will give you a choice between two characteristics. And to identify whatever it is, with, whether it be a, a plant, an animal, an insect, uh, you always choose the characteristic that best describes what you're looking at. So we're going to start with uh, an example, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go through a few more and talk about um, indigenous uses for some of these trees. So if you're out in a field and you come across um, a tree that has, you know, um, this kind of characteristics, down below here, we have the dichotomous key. So always a choice between two characteristics. So the first one here, number one and number one, is that the leaves are not needle-like or the leaves are needle-like. If you look up here, those leaves are needle-like, so you would go to uh, number three. So needles are in bundles or groups or they're single needles. We've got needles that are two per, per cluster or per group. So then you would go to number four. And again, we have a choice between two characteristics, two needles in each bundle or more than two needles in each bundle. Uh, here we have two. So we have a choice between two species and um, it's either red pine or jack pine. And from the information I had um, in Mi'kmaq, they're both called the same, which would be guo. Um, so if you look at the characteristics we've got uh, for the, the red pine, needles are straight, 10 to 16 centimeters long. They'll break or snap when you bend them. The cones are round, four to seven centimeters long, and the scales are thicker at the tip. So some of those characteristics, you almost have to have uh, the actual cones or needles to, to do that. Uh, the second one for jack pine, needles are yellow-green, two to four centimeters long. They're divergent, means that they split apart and twisted. The, the actual um, the needle here would have a twist to it. 
Uh, the cones are about the same length as for red pine. They're serotonous. Serotonous means that they 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 don't open easily. They're they're kind of gummed together. Um, and they're usually, I'm missing a word here, should, should read usually curved. So reading those two characteristics, um, what we see up here best fits jack pine. And that is what we have. So it's, it's just a nice way to use a key to, to help you uh, identify trees by looking at characteristics. Now, jack pine is one of the species that is characteristic of that really big uh, forest region that's in northern part of Canada, the, the boreal forest region. And trees of the boreal forest region are well adapted to fire. And uh, that characteristic of jack pine with those serotonous cones uh, lends itself to that really well. Uh, a fire will go through, a heat source will help open the cones. And another characteristic of, of jack pine is that it needs a lot of sunlight in order to grow well. Uh, it's what they call intolerant to shade. So after a fire, there's no competition. There's nothing that's going to shade out the, uh, the jack pine. So you end up seed falling down. They germinate very quickly and you end up with uh, another jack pine forest. So uh, a natural way of the, the forest system to rejuvenate itself. Um, the tree on the right here um, is also a jack pine, but it looks very different from what we see in the forest. And um, it's because it's grown out in, in, in the open. Um, growing up, we used to call these scrub pine and it's the, the the branches just reach out as far as they can to get as much of that sunlight as, um, as they can get. Uh, this is a species that most of you would probably be familiar with, um, but we're gonna use the key to, to, uh, to key it out and then we'll talk a little bit about it. So again, same part of the key, uh, leaves not needle-like or leaves are needle-like in this case, the leaves are not needle-like. Um, they're, they're sort of overlapping scales. So if they're not needle-like, you go to two and small flat scale-like leaves, soft yellow green in color. They're very small, one to two millimeters long. The cones are egg shaped and seven to 12. And that is Haskuzi, which is uh, the cedar. And the cedar is extremely important to indigenous people. Um, it's one of the four sacred medicines um, along with sage, sweet grass and uh, tobacco. Um, um, Pamela offered tobacco uh, this morning to uh, um, Elder Gordon as, as, as part of uh, an opening for this uh, reunion that we have. Sacred medicines are often used um, to invite all our relatives to a gathering and, and uh, Elder Gordon actually talked about that. Um, the elders be, or the, the, the relatives being uh, in the stars. The um, object on the right here is a smudge sticks. And these have been used for centuries in rituals uh, and cleansing ceremonies. They're known for their power to, oops, sorry about that, to purify objects and people and places. Uh, they attract good spirits and re repel negative energies. Um, cedar has many, uh, like most, most trees, has other names that we call them. So northern white cedar. Uh, there's this one here, arbor vitae, and that's really different from any of the other common names or, or other names that we hear from trees. And it was actually given by um, the explorer Jacques Cartier. And uh, if you try to break down arbor vitae, arbor being tree, like arbor day, vitae, uh, a little bit easier in French, uh, you can see the word V in there. So tree of life. And it was given that name uh, because many of the early explore explorers and settlers suffered 
from a disease called scurvy, and that was caused by deficiency in vitamin C. And the indigenous people shared their knowledge of their medicines uh, with the early explorers and settlers and taught them that by taking the foliage, the leaves of um, cedar, and by boiling it and making a tea out of that, um, since it was high in vitamin C, it would uh, cure or help prevent uh, cedar and uh, cedar, uh, scurvy. And that was a disease that uh, caused a lot of difficulty for the, um, the early uh, settlers and explorers. Uh, we'll do uh, one more softwood and then we'll jump to some uh, hardwoods. So um, we'll look at, uh, at this one. So you can see that the, um, the foliage, the, the needles are single. So that's, that's one of the characteristics that we're looking at. And we've got a couple of pictures of, of cones here. And we see some, some uh, of this growing up uh, in an old field. So again, we're going to go through the key. So in this, this time here, the leaves are needle-like. So we go to three, the needles are single. We go to seven and that'll bring us to the bottom end of the, um, of the, of the key. And then we're gonna look closely at the needles. If the needles are flat, means that you can't roll them between the two fingers or the needles are four-sided that you can roll them between the fingers. And we've done that and we see that the, the needles roll easily between the thumb and forefinger. So we go to nine and we're looking at the th one of the three spruce uh, species. It's either red spruce, black spruce, or white spruce. And in indigenous language, again, they're all known as gawak. Um, if we look at the characteristics here, I'm, I'm not going to read them all, but uh, here we have cones are five uh, centimeters long, uh, scales are pliable, and the needles have a strong pungent order. And that fits uh, best with uh, white spruce. And, and that is what this, this species is. And another characteristic of, of white spruce is that these needles are very, very sharp. They're much sharper than uh, the, the red or the black spruce. And one of the uses for the, the spruces was uh, the roots. The, the roots uh, of spruce are very shallow and they're strong and they're easy to harvest and they're flexible and were used for lashing. Um, they would uh, remove the, uh, the bark and boil it before, before using it. And they would use it in basketry, in, in things uh, like, like canoes here, anything that needed to be tied, um, the spruce roots would, was uh, a very good, uh, good uh, product to do that with. We're gonna switch to some hardwoods. Now we had 10 softwood, we have about 20 hardwoods. We have uh, three species of ash, uh, three of birch, uh, four maple, three poplar, or some people call them aspens, two oaks, and then we have uh, trees like basswood, beech, butternut, elm, and ironwood. Those are the trees that we would find in uh, the Wabanaki forest. Those are the indigenous trees of the region. And how do we identify uh, hardwood trees? Uh, when, we, we're gonna, when we look at the key, the first thing that's going to be asked is wh whether the, the leaves or the buds are opposite or whether they're alternate. So opposite buds, you can see here, we have bud there, bud there, one here, one there. And these are opposite buds. This is uh, the bud of a, of a, or the, a twig of a black ash or a weeshawk. And this, we've seen it already, it's a senawe or a sugar maple. So if the buds are opposite, that means that the leaves will be opposite. So it's, it's just a, a quick way of, uh, of uh, seeing what uh, the, the, where the buds are on a, 
on a twig and, and what that means. The other is uh, alternate, like here, um, beech, which is suomusi, or mushkui for the, um, the white birch. Now, what's interesting with that? Can I that, send in a question, Mom? What's interesting with that oh. is that if the buds are opposite, uh, it has to be either a, a an ash or a maple. It can't be anything else as long as it's a an indigenous tree, and then all of the other ones would fall into the uh, the alternate buds. Uh, another characteristic is what kind of leaf we have compound leaf again this is a weeshawk or, or black ash characteristic that's uh, interesting here or, or important is that these side leaves are called leaflets they're tied directly to this central leaf stalk uh, most leaves have what we call a leaf stalk or a petiole like this would be the petiole here that's the petiole there, and the petiole usually attaches directly to uh, the twig. Um, that doesn't happen here. There, there is no petiole uh, for black ash. That's, that's a, a, an important characteristic when you're looking to identify it. Um, two examples of simple leaf we have, this is large tooth aspen or miti or uh, oak, um, mimguak hanimusi. Uh, had a hard time learning to pronounce that one. Uh, we can also look at uh, the shape of the leaf margins or leaf edges. They can be smooth, they can be tooth. Some of them have double teeth. Um, like this is, this would be a tooth, this would be a tooth, and then you have teeth in between. That means they're double tooth. They can be fine tooth, lobed, wavy, just different descriptive um, words to describe the, the leaf edge. And of course, bark, uh, quite a few species, you can identify them just by looking at the bark. Um, over here, we have uh, mm -hmm. menohan, which is uh, yellow birch or silver birch, uh, suomusi, which is the beech. This one has been affected by uh, beech bark disease. Uh, about 95, 96% of all our beech have been, ident have been um, affected by this disease. And of course, um, this is uh, an easy one for most people, uh, mashgui or, um, or white birch. An interesting thing about mashgui is that uh, I grew up um, um, Acadian, French Acadian, and my father taught me the word mashgui when I was very young. And he used to refer to mashgui as the bark of the white birch. So I always called it mashgui, and I thought it was an old Acadian word. We had a lot of old Acadian words when I grew up, and um, those have disappeared from our language because they weren't proper French. Um, but mashgui, I always thought was uh, an, uh, an Acadian word, and um, learned, uh, I think it was last year, that it was actually an Indigenous uh, word that had uh, come into the uh, Akkadian language. And we had other um, Indigenous words that we also use, but those um, are disappearing as well. Um, the fruit, um, these are some called Samaras for the, the maple and the ashes. Uh, catkins, this is one of the poplars. This is um, yellow birch. Uh, of course, the acorn. These are butternuts and uh, beech nuts. And um, again, this is uh, just the, the key. So the first thing we're going to look at is whether the leaves are opposite or the leaves are, are not opposite. And whenever they're opposite, you can see all of the species here are either maple or ash and everything that's not opposite are all of the, uh, the other ones. So we're gonna go through the same exercise. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on the key. We'll just look at the characteristics here. We can see that the buds are opposite and the leaf is compound. Um, these leaflets uh, have no leaf stalk or petiole. Um, this is uh, the bark, it's kind of brownish. Uh, it grows kind of in a, a wet area and the fruit has uh, 
uh, is a Samara. So if we were to use the key here, we would end up with black ash, which, which is Wieshock. Um, and black ash, uh, again, um, I mentioned earlier, it's very important uh, to indigenous people. It's best known for uh, basketry, um, also used for um, things like barrels, snowshoe frames, canoe ribs, um, and many other things. Um, one of the characteristics of black ash is that it has a straight grain. Uh, the same can be said for uh, white ash. Um, black ash is also very pliable. So by taking the uh, uh, a piece of wood from black ash and pounding it with, uh, let's say, the uh, uh, the back of uh, of an axe, you can actually separate the the, um, the growth rings, and then by treating those, evening them up, uh, you can end up making some beautiful. Um, uh, it's like uh, we can be, see here. Um, we made a presentation to um, Elsie Booktuck uh, last fall, and um, um, Elder uh, Joe John uh, has a, a video on uh, on making baskets that uh, you might, uh, if if anybody's interested in that, you can have a look at that. Can't talk about ash without talking about um, this little critter here. Um, it's emerald ash borer. I know that this afternoon, um, Kristen Allen and Steve Ganish will be speaking on invasive species and, and emerald ash borer in particular. But uh, for those who might not be able to uh, catch that presentation, I just want to put a put a a, a couple of things about black ash. Um, it poses a serious threat to all. Uh, ash species, including black ash. Um, it was introduced, well, introduced in 2002 is not really correct. Uh, it was first identified or or noticed in 2002. It, it probably came in in, in, in the late 1990s. Um, they found it um, in Michigan near Detroit and in Canada uh, near, um, ah, I forget, Windsor. And since then, it's moved to about 35 U.S. states and um, five Canadian provinces. Last year, they found it in, uh, no, in 2018, they found it in New Brunswick, uh, near Edmonston, um, 2019 in Moncton and uh, Oromocto, near Fredericton, and uh, last year in, um, in Fredericton. Uh, they haven't found any new occurrences in 2021, as far as I know. But a very serious pest. Um, this is the, the adult here. It's a, it's a beetle. You can see where it gets its name. Uh, it'll lay its eggs on the bark of the, uh, the ash tree. Uh, after the eggs hatch, these larvae will come out and they'll penetrate the bark and they'll start feeding inside the bark uh, on a layer that's called the phloem. And the phloem basically um, transports the nutrients that are that are produced in the leaves to all parts of the tree. So by creating these feeding galleries, um, the larvae or the, the emerald ash borer basically cuts off the circulation of the tree. And uh, that is not a good thing. That'll, that'll kill the tree very, very quickly. Uh, we'll do another one. I, I know that we're getting a little pressed for time here, uh, Pamela. Um, identify this tree here. Again, we're looking at alternate buds. We're looking at a leaf that is, um, this would be um, double tooth because you have teeth there and teeth there and teeth in between. Uh, we have bark that is white and, and peels. And we'll just go through the, um, the key very, very quickly. So leaves are not opposite. Uh, it's a simple leaf. So we go to nine. The leaf edge is double tooth. So we go to 10. Uh, the leaf shape is either triangular or not triangular. This is not triangular. Um, so we go to 12. Uh, 
the underside is rough and the leaf base is asymmetrical. Asymmetrical means that it's not even. This one is even. This is an example of an asymmetrical base. So you can see that it's not the same on either side. And all of the leaves of this, and, and, and this is um, an elm tree, all of the leaves have that, that characteristic. So they're um, not asymmetrical. So you go to 13 and um, because the bark is white and peeling, um, the veins, when they talk about the veins, they're talking about these features here. And it's really hard to see on the, um, on the image. Uh, this is the central vein or the midrib. And then you get these other veins that go to the end of the, the big teeth. So it's, it's just a, a counting thing. But for mushkwi or, or white birch, um, the, the bark is really all you need to uh, identify. And it has to be, has to, has to be uh, readily peeling. And of course, um, white birch is another uh, species that's well known uh, to uh, indigenous people and, and um, some of its uses. You have uh, various containers. Here's a, a moose call, of course, a canoe and teepee, all uses, all indigenous uses for um, the white, bir white birch uh, tree or the mushkwi. And um, this is the last one I have. And um, um, again, we have this compound leaf and we have a uh, alternate buds, we have big nuts. Um, and this is the bark and it's showing a disease there. So if it's a compound leaf and the leaves are not, uh, are not opposite, the only thing it can be is uh, is butternut and um, butternut one of the characteristics of the wood is that it's soft and has a beautiful grain and you can use it for a uh, wood carving uh, the two masks that you see there um, they were um, made by uh, ned bear um, ned bear uh, lived in saint mary's first nation uh, but he he passed away in 2019 um, another thing I want to mention about butternut is that it's an endangered species, another one of those species that uh, is being affected by um, an exotic or a, a, an introduced uh, disease. In this case, it's, it's a fungus. And oops. And if you look here, this is the sign of the fungus. It, it's, uh, it, um, just um, shows up black and it'll, it'll, it'll start seeping out like a black inky um, substance. And same as the emerald ash borer, it's, um, it's killing a lot of the um, butternut trees. And uh, New Brunswick is one of the last places where um, butternut trees are, the populations are still relatively healthy in, in other parts of the range, most of the butternut are gone. And uh, that's it. Um, thank you very much, Well, Alan. Now you're muted, Pam. I knew that. Gotcha. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bernie. I'm going to stop recording and then I'll continue to talk. <clears throat> Wonderful. Always, always.